Uh, email is sent to you around 11 o'clock. What we're looking at, as we often do when we do workshop, this is uh, one of your classmates' work, so of course we should be respectful. I don't foresee any issues with that, but I like to just start every workshop with that statement, you know, let's not be dicks. Uh, beyond that, um, this is the homework that was due. Some of you haven't turned it in yet, you should. Um, mainly my goal today is, because uh, I, I like to kind of inch you guys closer and closer to the paper. So what I'm thinking is, last time we had a much less formal sort of just exchanging of ideas. Here's what I'm working on and we all kind of hashed it out. We did that with a couple people. Today, I want to take a slightly more formal approach. So what that's going to mean is, you're going to read uh, this PDF in front of you. It won't take two or three minutes, right? And as a class, we're going to start where we were last time. We're going to hash out a little less formally what we think they're doing, what they could improve on, what they might look at, all that stuff. But then by the end of class, I want to move into some slightly more boring territory, namely, how are we going to outline this thing? Maybe we start thinking about how to actually build body paragraphs. We'll see how we do. To begin with, obviously, I want you to read over what I sent to you. Um, they have it organized into a uh, thesis, question mark, which is fine. It's more just roughly what they're thinking, right? And then two arguments, which the way I would paraphrase that is kind of the beginnings of two body paragraphs, maybe, right? Or at the very, very least, two areas of the film they're interested in looking at. Read over that, and we're just going to see how we can uh, improve upon it. You should come up. We're looking at an email I sent this morning. Uh, it seems like maybe this one locks and that one doesn't. Because he just walked right in. Not the magic touch. Well, either way, if anybody's ever late, try that door first. Because I think that one opens. But it could be that. Take another couple minutes with this, we're going to talk about it. Do I need more time? Cool. All right. To begin with, I said this already. They kind of clue us into this already with their thesis? Question mark, right? They don't really have a thesis yet, and that's fine. They haven't written the paper yet. But they're very, very, especially in that first paragraph, <laughs> paragraph concerned with what aspect of the film. 
Like they don't know what they think about it, but it's this one thing. And more specifically, how what he is. Out of place and, and uncomfortable, yeah. right? Like as a result of that difference. McLean doesn't fit in and he knows it, right? Now, that's what we're going to talk about today. And I picked this one for two reasons. One, we keep, I mean, mostly I think I'd probably keep bringing it to your attention, but we keep kind of touching on it and we haven't really solved it yet. We haven't really come up with what to say about it. That interests me. And secondly, it's just weird. It's a weird element of the film, right? It doesn't get a lot of play in scholarship either, so it's worth thinking about. Even in this first paragraph, they said a thing that struck me. Oh, I gotta find it now. They say the real question is what caused this separation in distance? Was it John, meaning McLean? We have to dive into their head a little bit, and that's hard. We're not mind readers. What do you think they're getting at? Like, did that make sense to any of you, those questions at the end? What they're kind of thinking about? What caused, yeah, go ahead. Whoever it was, somebody said something. I just said yes. Okay. <laughs> How so? Um, well, it kind of, I, I wrote about one of those, one of my theses, uh -huh. I guess. But it was like, I don't know, John's just like, again, he's from like kind of the middle class. He's a cop. Yeah. He's a little brown. He hangs out in the city. Yeah. And now he's like in this big tower that's like got a lot of like big business type people in it. He just doesn't seem very comfortable in that sort of environment. Like even at the beginning of the movie when he's uh, being flown in, yeah, you see he's like he shows like flaws, kind of like he's kind of a dick. Yep. Um, he's afraid of flying. Yeah. And heights, I, I guess. Well, I was gonna say I like the point you made at some uh, at some point in there. He's low to the ground. He said he's in this tower now. He also doesn't like, like, absolutely there's a question of altitude in the movie, um, heights, and how that might um, sort of stand for something at times, right? I mean, what is it to be on a plane? And then also, what is it to be super high up in one of these skyscrapers? Like, the higher up you go, we usually have certain associations with that, right? Like. I think absolutely that's that's doing something here. I kind of cut you off. No, it's, it's okay. Just like, I don't know, he's, he's afraid of flying. Yeah. And like, also he's in the tower, and I'm guessing like the fear of heights kind of comes with fear of flying as well. So maybe. Yeah. I mean, we don't know that he's strictly afraid of heights, because like the one time he really reacts is when he's on top of the building and he's about to jump off of it. But I think anybody, like, who's not cowering in a puddle is like, you know, Doing all right in that case. Cool. All right, we got a little bit to go on there. Any other thoughts just on that first paragraph, especially those questions at the end? And this whole business about like, was it was it John? Was it McLean? What do you think they mean by that? Oh, separate from his wife? No, like does he disconnect on purpose? Oh. Well, I would quibble with it on purpose. I mean, I'm not sure if they're saying that or not. But I think at the very least we could say, is it his fault? Right? Sure, sure. That's, uh, uh, what I'm quibbling with is intent. Like, I don't know, because all they give us is, was it John? I don't know if they would go that far or not. But I think absolutely they're wondering, is he playing more of a role in this than he, even he realizes, potentially? Maybe. That's kind of interesting. Ah. Yeah, future reference. Tell me that. That's kind of funny to me. We're going to lock that one. We're going to leave that one. Okay. Other two paragraphs. What, what other, uh, we highlight some scenes. I think we also highlight some specific elements like for instance 
What else seems to make McLean uncomfortable here? We get a couple more things. And there's different ways to talk about that, right? The, the way we talked about it last time was this sort of new idea of marriage. Part of that is the wife being independent or more independent, right? We kind of we came to the consensus that like she's not she's not in charge, she's not completely independent. It's a partnership, though, right? Like it's more like if Holly was down here before, now she's like she wants it to be. But we are saying, especially at the beginning of the movie, McLean doesn't seem super comfortable with that idea pretty plain to see when they fight about it. Okay, cool. What else? I don't remember that last paragraph now, actually. Hey, what's the deal with our guy? When he first meets him, he's just kind of like, like deadly, pretty much. Yeah. And one idea we had was that he really seems to soften up when, when Argyle says it's his first time in a limo, it's almost like you can see McLean just like, oh, awesome, okay, mine too. Let's figure this out together, buddy, right? Like we're equals now or something. So I put money here. We could, we could define that a little bit better. Like you can have money, but then riding around in a limo is a little bit different. Do you know what I'm saying? Like. Like, what does it tell other people if you're riding around in a limo? Do you think? You're important. Okay. Do I know? You're at the very least, you have a means to portray an image of importance. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, because, like, the reason the limo interests me, especially, especially because Argyle compares it to a cab, right? When he says he used to drive one. What's a cab for? Taking you from one place to another. What's a limo for? They're the same damn thing, but they're not. One is about function, the other is about image, right? So, yeah, it's not just money, it's like, uh, I mean, we can put image here for lack of a better, but it's kind of flaunting that in a way it, that, that makes him super uncomfortable, you could argue, right? Because you see him interact with people who, like uh, Takagi is his name. That guy clearly has money. I don't feel like McLean seems uncomfortable with him. I'm using my memory here. It doesn't stand out as much as the other. Well, maybe it's a facade there. From who? Well, McLean? Yeah, like McLean is putting on more of a masculine facade. He's not going to show that it makes him uncomfortable, even though. He That's interesting. Money. Okay. Maybe. We're going to have to give like a subterranean layer to this then. Because now we have uncomfortable, and then we have can't let you know I'm uncomfortable. Uh, maybe. we got to talk about that for a minute then. I hadn't considered that, and I have real thoughts on it, but I don't want to just give them to you. If, because we have to do it this way first, I think. If you think that he might be sort of pretending with Takagi, right? Why? Why would he do that? Well, it's just, I mean, it's, it's like a typical trail of being masculine. You don't mm. want another male to see you as weaker. And in this case, the money status is a sign of weakness if you're looking at it from Takagi's point of view. So the fact that Takagi clearly has money because he's the boss. They're in this corporation and all. McLean walks in knowing he like can't compete in that way with that guy. So uh, you're saying like that's one motive for him to come off as super comfortable. Like I'm a good dog, whatever. Yeah, you know? he has to make it up in other ways since he can't match it with money. Maybe. Do you have another way in mind that he does that? Well, by acting like a dick, acting like he doesn't care about anything. Does he do that with Takagi? Not blatantly, but he kind of... Because they, they talk to each other is what I'm getting at. Does anybody remember, do you remember what they say? Does anybody remember what they say? Oh, man. I'm using my memory. He just kind of seems nonchalant. Like, 
Yeah, well, because, man, they talk about, um... Isn't it, like, just pleasantries, kind of? Well, kind of. They talk about Pearl Harbor. Oh, yeah. So it's, like, it's not your typical, like, oh, bombed you guys. Oh, well, you know. It's, um... I don't remember who initiates it now, because I'm using my memory, and that's what sucks about this, but... But you're talking about when he gets off the elevator into the party? I mean, when he run, yeah, when he, run, he runs into Takagi there. Yeah, Takagi initiates that. And, okay, and he, can he tell them he sent... He, he says, I take it out of you to thank for the limo. Yeah. That's how it starts. That is how it starts. And that's an interesting question, because you got to wonder whether or not he means that as a thank you, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm taking notes like it makes sense. I'm so sorry. But after that, they start this conversation where Takagi says something like, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, something about like selling Americans radios or something like that was like how the Japanese got back after the war. And like, it's the idea that like America and Japan have healed their relationship in some ways, it's a really weird exchange. We don't have time to look it up, I don't think. What the hell, maybe we did. Oh God, all right. Because we know all the other ones. This one, this one is so small. In defense of me, I didn't hook all this up because I didn't think we would use it, and if we didn't, I would just leave it here, and I'd be really bummed out. So that's all that is. But now you get to watch me squirm, so that's kind of fun. I'm all but positive. I may not even know. So, a couple of things happened there. I'm gonna get rid of this so we can use the board. All my crap is on there. We go. So I agree, especially after watching the scene, that you could argue there's a little bit of sniping going, playful, a little bit of sniping going on between those two guys. I'm curious what you guys think about, like, what does McLean say to Takagi in Holly's office? Well, the, the question about Christmas yeah. is obviously meant to be, maybe not an insult, but kind of a... It's like, oh, you do oh, this too? Sort of. That kind of goes back to what we were talking about a few weeks ago. Okay. Like, he was talking to that guy at the front desk. He's like, wow, this computer is the same. Basically oh, okay. Okay, uh, it's, it's belittling in a way. Yeah, yeah, how guys just take gas at each other. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, so, hmm. on the one hand, we could just say, maybe McLean just likes to take gas at people. He does. Well, that's part of how you tell people you're a man, right? But here again, especially uh, in this scene, it's, I mean, pretty obviously, I guess you, you work with what you have, and if you're a 30, 40-ish, white dude against a 60 something Asian guy, you go with race. But in this particular scene, he's like, Japanese people know what Christmas is? This is basically what he says. And it, you could definitely make the case that like there's a little bit of, not a lot, but a little bit of like, that's funny, uh -huh, type of thing. What does Takagi come back with? He's like, remember when you killed a bunch of motherfuckers? Yeah. Haha. Uh -huh. I can play this game too. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I feel like a big part of it too. Um, forgot this guy's name, I'm gonna kill that guy. Ellis. Ellis. You know, John just completely like after he's like in his son, you know, he's just completely getting in out of it. He dismisses him. Yeah, he's like, you're lesser than me. That's Why true. Don't you get my wife's office? And yeah. I, I just don't care for you. I'm gonna stick with this. Well, that, as soon as he laughs, no, Ellis is like Takagi's like hype man at that point. Yeah, yeah. When he's, you can argue argue from a plot perspective, he's there to like diffuse any tension. 
because he's obviously like the fool in the room. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like, absolutely, he's like a non-factor when it comes to this. McLean and Takagi can kind of go back and forth, but Holly comes in and stops it, right? Ellis isn't even, he's like, oh, you're, you're just a stupid cokehead with a stupid laugh. Yeah, we, don't, we don't need to address you. So he knows how to handle Ellis. He might, you might even say he's used to handling folks like that because he tends to arrest them, right? He's comfortable with that. That's back to his world. Oh, you're, you're doing a bunch of coke. Yeah, I know what that is. I can make sense of that. This other stuff, not so much. And it's weird. This one, I, I can't decide if we should attach this or not. Because look, obviously this comes into play when he walks into the party, right? And he's obviously uncomfortable with a lot of stuff. I almost wonder, hmm, rather than, maybe this line would be stuff he's more comfortable with. Because he seems like he could play that game with Takagi all day. Um, he knows how to handle Ellis. And then eventually all the terrorists somehow. He looks pretty comfortable with that, I think, for the most part. Uh, one other thing in this scene that stood out to me that I forgot about. Um, and it's kind of quick, but kind of not. Did you guys catch, like, he's looking for his wife, but that's not the first thing he finds? Do you, do you guys know what I'm saying? No, before that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like how I pointed out in the airport. You checked out the Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's weird because, again, that's a decision they made, right? They wanted you to see, like, he's looking for his wife, but, like, while he's looking for her, he can look. Right? And he seems very comfortable all of a sudden doing that. Right? Yes. Just in like May, some details. with how they're presented. Yeah. I was yeah. Like, so you don't see them very often. Yeah. Like, you know, Holly's kind of got that like, um, you know, she knows what she's doing. But even like, I, I guess it's like a mini waterfall you see when she's yeah. leaning against this. I know. I know. Um, the sun sets behind her. You know, it's a very yeah. feminine, feminine-esque kind of like scene for her. Yeah. And so you know, maybe like, oh. All right. So I'm gonna put this in a particular way, and I have a reason. I'm not just being an asshole. <laughs> This naked, yeah. maybe. They all have very 80s hair. It actually makes it hard for me. I'm not kidding. I'm pretty sure the dress, I don't know. I, might I, dress. I, I remember their hair, and it's all big, so it's, it's kind of. But, uh, but the distinction you're making, again, and it, it's kind of cool like how these play together. This is Holly, and what Holly represents, and who Holly is, and who she's becoming. And this is more. Picturesque in the sense, like we're talking about image. When he sees that woman through a waterfall somehow, 30 floors up, and I'll come to you, and he sees her against the sunset, that's a certain image of femininity that it seems like he's much more comfortable with, you could argue. The male gaze. Yeah, and it kind of what it turns women into here. Because you see, you see a great example later, again, with the ladies in the maintenance hallway. Or is it like, hey girls, and they're naked, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, just like, I guess, like, you kind of like separated, I guess, what he's uncomfortable with. Yeah. And he's comfortable with, like, and just kind of like, yeah, he's, it's these two worlds kind of going on, and I guess yeah. like he's figuring that they don't match. Like, what they don't mix. The relationship doesn't mix. Like, yeah. The New York stuff, this is New York stuff. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, because he, he says it here again. California versus New York City. He's a blue collar guy. Very much not riding around in limos, right? So the what he is, all this stuff that he knows and he's comfortable with, the movie seems to suggest for some reason he can't, at least initially. Sorry, that was very distracting. Uh, initially, he can't wrap his head around. At this point, I'm just waiting for that to go. But I do have to know what it is. 
We have enough here. Now, why do we do this? What you should never do, and I want to make this point real quick, is write me a compare contrast essay. Okay? When you make an argument, ideally, you want that to be an argument worth making. And at no point do you have to convince me that there are things that he likes and things that he doesn't. I know that. Right? All we've done to this point is build a really good, I think, inventory. Specific, too, like, this is about the plane and about being high up in a building. This is about like the scene we just watched. It's about Argyle. You can go to very specific points in the film to get to these ideas, okay? And very clearly it has illustrated for us, this is his world. This is where he's gone to get his wife back. It's almost like she's locked up in a tower full of this stuff. These are all the dragons and he's the knight. He's gonna go get her back, right? Now again, what's interesting in the movie is the longer he's there, for some reason, he gets more comfortable with at least some of this stuff. I'm not going to say all of it, but you know, especially that one, right? So what? We'll, go ahead. I don't think he gets more comfortable. I think it's that more of the stuff he's used to gets mixed in with that stuff. What do you mean by that? Well, when it starts out, you know, it's strictly he's in this big building, he's surrounded by people with money, he's dealing yeah. with. But by the end, he's dealing with criminals. He's dealing with no, for sure. Well, no, his, his his world kind of invades it, I guess. Yeah. But but then, like when he's shooting people, he's not even worried about it. He's not dealing with any of this stuff. Like he's just dealing with that. You know what I'm saying? Like this world kind of takes over. So the point I'm making is like, I still don't know that he's super comfortable with that. I doubt he's pretty comfortable with that. Jury's out on that, but I'm sure he's ambivalent at best. Like, I, I, I think this one is the only one you can point to and like conclusively and say, there's evidence in the film to suggest by the end, he and Holly like have somehow spoken to each other without ever speaking, right? Like they, they come around on their own together. Like it's kind of nice in a weird way, it's kind of cute. Um, but, but my point is, what we gotta figure out now, cause we, we have too much to potentially write a paper, like which is a good problem to have, okay? What I'm saying is, we gotta figure out what it is we're talking about. So I'm gonna ask you the big question, the big scary question, and then I'm gonna try to bring it back to like a sane place. What does any of this have to do with us? That big question, right? Oh, is your hand up? Okay, one, but I was like. Oh, well, just what does it say about us as a people, society, and culture? Just the app. I was going to say that there's a pretty big, like, not make, like a classism kind of statement with it, but you could say that there is a big divide between, you know, I guess, like, big corporation and then those who are kind of, like, more the, down to earth, quite... The little guy? Even I think we're talking about class. Yeah. Oh, I think we are. I didn't, I didn't want to say, like, class, I think you were like, oh, no, but, like, I, I think it has a big thing with class. And sure. You physically, you do have that kind of distance versus... Yeah. Being ground level and then being super high with like executives and all these yeah. rich people, and I think that um, you know putting kind of someone on the lower end of the spectrum into this situation, you know, it kind of yeah. feels like there is a big contrast, and you know, they're kind of putting like uh, Obi Wan to a deep step, you know, it's like uh, what am I supposed to do? Okay, what we've highlighted here. While you were talking, you reminded me of one more thing, and this is small, and it may not come into, come into this paper, but it's worth pointing out. You said literal, like physical distance, height specifically. I always think, too, when somebody points that out, about Al. When we meet him, he gets called to go to the building, and then he does a weird thing. He goes to his car, he throws his like 12 Twinkies or whatever into the car, and instead of getting in, he walks to the street and looks at the building, and we kind of pan up with his gaze, right? We're seeing how tall it is. That's a really strange thing to do. 
No one does that. They're like, I gotta go here, I better go physically look at it first. Like no one So we're we're making the point for Al too, it seems like he's on this side of that line, even though he lives here. And of course McLean is instantly comfortable with him for some obvious reasons, but I think some less obvious ones too. I think it has to do with their colloquially fear of heights. They don't like that building for some reason. Makes makes Al uncomfortable too. Which is interesting. Yes? Can you let us know what you have on the back? Sure. Just because I have like um, I know people who are too comfortable and sure. like that's it just in their personal lives, whenever they go into somewhere they're not used to, yeah. it's for them to be this big building, they instantly are like, I need to see everything. And so, and like I need McLean to definitely does that. I was gonna say, like the scene that we saw, you know, um, he's like surveying everything. Well, he does it right before that, too, before he gets on the elevator. Yeah, he and definitely... He, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, you know, uh, he's trying to take in everything, but yeah. it's to a point where it's like, there's so much going on, he doesn't maybe understand that it's like... He can't know. Yeah. Can't. So that's why maybe he focuses in on like one thing that he can't know. Yeah. He finds, you know, the big guy, and then he's like, okay, you know, it's like one at a time because that's really how he's built. He can be. Yeah. But he can't focus on everything. Well, then, so part of part of McLean's discomfort seems to come from. Is your hand up? I couldn't tell. Okay. Seems to come from like a lack of knowledge. Then, like if he knows the situation or if he feels like he can understand it, it seems like we're pretty good. But all these other moments where McLean is less sure of himself, doesn't have like knowledge to draw upon, he, get, he becomes uncomfortable. Get slightly more specific. Who is McLean in this movie? We've talked about this a few times, but we, we, gotta, we gotta do it now. Who is he? What kind of guy is he? Everyman. He's an everyman. Very good. Purposefully shown to be an everyman. Most of the movie, he's wearing a tank top. You know what I'm saying? Like, and even when he's dressed up, you saw that. That's not dressed up. His hair is ridiculous. I, I forget sometimes, but I notice in this scene, it's it's not good. He's not worried about it. He's an everyman. He's got other stuff going on. So when we say this movie is talking about class, if we're focused on McLean, now we can focus on other characters and think about you know, other questions revolving around class, okay? But in McLean's case, it seems like, I was like, are you going to tell me there's no eraser right now? Seems like we're talking about working class men. So our question is the same, but it's more specific. What are we trying to say about working class men in America here in 1988? It's got something to do with being uncomfortable, with knowledge, the lack of it. What? What might it mean if McLean is supposed to be an everyman? So he's supposed to stand for that, that kind of dude, right? What might the movie be suggesting about the things he is comfortable with, do you think? What are, those, what are these things to that kind of guy? Why are they normal to that kind of guy? Okay. Having to prove himself in the blue collar in any given day. Like yeah. That. Whereas the uh, you know the higher up, they don't have to worry about those things. In yeah. Literal sense, they're above them in this film. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So the world he knows in in all of the, these ways. Um, 
want to push on that a little bit. Like, how do you guys, I'll, I'll open it up a little bit because most of them just talk to this part of the room with a little bit of uh, some iron here. What, uh, how do you know something is normal? What's baseline? Oh, um, if a majority of people are doing it. Okay. So, for example, someone's not wearing, if everyone's not wearing a hat, then they're normal. So One guy in a hat, it's kind of weird. Yeah. Well, like another way to think of it, this is this is the fourth conversation I've had about this today, weirdly. Um, if I came into class without a shirt, that would be strange. That would be abnormal. Yeah. Why? Because everybody else is wearing a shirt and you're not. Well, if, well, if you guys were without a shirt, it'd be weird too, though. If we all came in shirtless, it'd be weird. Yeah. It is, but I'm just asking, like, how do we define it? And that colors our expectations. Like, I expect you guys to show up topped. And you expect the same of me. And yes, that's because that's what people do. But because of that, we also expect that to continue. You see what I'm saying? So one idea is that McLean knows what to expect here. He knows how it works. He knows what's going to happen for the most part. He's not surprised, okay? This stuff, he knows less about. He doesn't know what to expect. He doesn't know how to navigate it. Yes? Does this kind of building off, and I'm so sorry, you said like something else whenever, this kind of reminds me of like how I mentioned like Ethan. Okay. Um, you know, in his kind of like own realm, he tends to take on a, kind of like a more masculine center of how he goes about things, you know? Yeah. More violent. Yeah. And I mentioned, um, at least in my thesis, that the way that Holly is, where she's like a little, like a lot less violent, you know, she's more of, um, you know, like, hey, we need to like survey this, and, like check it out, see what's going on. That's typically more feminine traits. She's a planner. Yeah. Um, he tends to go about that in this situation where he isn't like, you know, it's not his realm of like knowledge, you know, but he's kind of like dropping it even though he doesn't know. And so instead of going in super headstrong, like he even says himself, if he would have like in the hostage situation, if he would have gone in, they would have like killed him with Ellis. Yeah, they, they, yeah, he would have died. We could have gotten other people killed. But when he like took a step back and he was like, okay, what can I do? You know, yeah, taking on that more like um, like quote feminine approach to it. You know, I thought that was a really interesting thing um, about it. You know, he changes through this like scenario, like the situation he's posed in. You know, kind of like changes his outlook on how he would go about this. I've joked about this before. I think when we were talking about Rocky, but normally to do the masculine, manly thing is to do the illogical thing. Like if it's raining, you don't bring an umbrella. Type like that is kind of what you're getting at. Interesting. Because we don't know what he's like before. Chances are very good he hasn't dealt with many terrorist uh, situations before. But he's at a disadvantage, like numbers-wise. I don't remember how he counts them. I don't remember how many terrorists there are. There's only one of him. So he's at a supreme disadvantage. And you can argue that being disadvantaged, being in a less powerful position, maybe forces him to appreciate this, uh, another, a characteristic of the disadvantaged. Does that make sense? If we are coding this feminine, and again, we're using like capital S stereotypes here. But if this is more feminine, whereas this kind of man stuff would be your Rambos, your Terminators, your like, you know what I'm saying? How are we gonna get through this wall? And somebody punches it like type of thing, like you've seen those. He can't do that because he's not in a position of power. So you kind of argue in a way you can connect man stuff to power. But by, by being disadvantaged, we're beginning to argue he transitions to at least this one bit of this side of things. Now, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. I want you to try to stay with me as best you can. These are all about power. But this one isn't, not in the same way. So I kind of wonder, here's what I'm thinking. I'm gonna ask you guys if I'm making sense. 
when the movie starts, and I've told you already, I'm not good at taking notes. Like, this is how my head works, I'm sorry. When the movie starts, we got this line. This is him on this side. This is California and Holly and everything he's headed towards. He doesn't understand it, he doesn't like it, Ugh, right? Like, that's how he feels about it. As the movie plays out, he's in a disadvantaged position. You could argue he comes to appreciate what it is to be powerless in this way. Maybe he didn't know that before, you would begin to argue. And so he has to take on certain aspects of this side. This side is very much about logic and planning, I think, for the most part, right? As a result of that, you could argue, he comes to appreciate some of this world, but not all of it. And the dividing line here seems to be what's about keeping power for yourself versus sharing it, I think. Or being not, being not as worried about it. Does that make any sense? Sure. Yeah, I guess in a sense it does because, like, for me, um, like, one of the pieces I wrote about yeah. is kind of about, like, the masculine thing is that it's without no doubt that, like, he's your stereotypical masculine character, whereas, like, his villain uh -huh. kind of really isn't on that same frame, and the way that makes him dominant and the way that makes him masculine is through the power and through the logic. That's and, true. Like, I will say though, he but he does employ a fucking Viking. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I Call. I would disagree with that. I would say that Hans is more ruthless than. Well, like I'm, we're, she's she's saying like Hans Gruber is absolutely like a corporate guy. Well, he's also not afraid to get his hands dirty. That's true. But it's only like a if necessary kind of situation. Okay. So that, he kills Takagi for no reason. Well, yeah, it he mean it. Um, I mean, That's true. He's sadistic. Yeah. He is that. He's got a streak to him. It. And he's still the Viking that you're talking about. Call. The Viking obeys him without question. So what does that say? He damn near doesn't. Well, I mean, for the probably. most part, up until the end. Yeah, I'm saying they, they keep Carl reined in, but you get the sense that like they, they got him on a leash that like's trying to break. Yeah. He probably dates the Viking like top dollar. I hate that we're calling him the Viking. His name is Carl. <laughs> but. I like but I'm just saying, like, especially, like, the, the part, again, it's a ridiculous scene when they're chasing McLean, and he's got a gun about as, as long as his own body, and he's carrying it like this for no reason at all, and he's just calmly walking across the... What do you mean the hall? Hmm? It's an hall that he's carrying. Sure. But my point is, <laughs> show some hustle. <laughs> like, get over there. You know what I'm saying? And, but it's, it's presented in this, like, if usually, the point I think I'm trying to make your point is, Usually in a movie like this, the villain would be Carl. He'd be more like Carl, right? Whereas now, Hans has some of that, and it's buried, which is interesting. It only comes out occasionally, but like, he's not your typical villain in the same way McLean is not your typical hero, you know? That, that felt like a bit of a tangent, but... All right, we gotta collect some of this. All right. So look. What happened? I said we do have like 12 different pieces. I know. Well, no, no, we're just, this is an inventory. I think our, I think our thesis is here. I think it's here. So a couple things we're, we're concerned with are power and the lack of it. I hesitate to put this on here, but it does seem kind of important. Logic, and then potentially, this might, and it might not, by the way, it might tie into that larger conversation we were having about marriage uh, last time. What are we saying about working class men here in 1988? Saying something about power, and, and their relationship with power, potentially what that has to do with their ability to plan, and or what any of that might have to do with like the evolution of marriage.
and how we think of it. Let's start with the first one. Working class man, 1988. What's his relationship with power? Again, stereotypically, like that's not that's not his. If we're if we're comparing it to these folks, right? Not not much. Yeah. I think it's important that McLean's a cop because, like, again, in the grand scheme, he doesn't have power. He's still a working class guy, right? But you can argue in certain situations, cops have real power, right? The movie also wouldn't make sense if he was like an accountant. Uh, they made this movie. It makes about as much sense as it is. But I, 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 fair point. But I'm just saying it. Okay, here's what I'm wondering. The first gap we got across. Usually, working class guy has no power, right? But I think. In a lot of the movie, in different spaces, McLean does have power. Generally speaking, comparing him to the terrorists, there's so many more of them, he's at a disadvantage. Okay, more on that in a minute. But when he's going back and forth with Takagi, say it's a draw, okay? Ellis, he disavows basically immediately. Uh, he shrugs off that dude that kisses him, California. What the fuck? Like he's. There's a way, I think, we can start to argue, he's able to empower himself in a very specific way. And I'm just curious if we can put language to that. So like, the way he talks to Takagi, the way he treats Ellis, uh, ooh, I want to get this quotation right, and I am quoting, so go easy on me, but he says, uh, when he's talking to, to the police deputy captain, he says, I'm not the one who just got butt-fucked on national television. Yeah. That's a very specific thing to say to somebody. And that's a direct quotation, by the way. Let's play with that one for a second. Why does he say that? It's pretty colorful language. If he wants to let the deputy police chief know that he screwed up. That's sure. He's gonna be like, yeah, you did this. But that's bad. Ooh. Yeah, but we can we can it's not just what he says, it's how he says it. There's plenty of ways to say you messed up. Well the question is who's messed up in it. How? Uh, well I hate to go with the that hey the movie goes there. The movie goes there. <laughs> Sure. To question them. I mean, it's basically like you just became someone's bitch. Hey, that's what he says. Yeah. That's what he says. You're fine. That's what the movie says. Again, the point I'm making, I don't think that's too dissimilar. I mean, he's more respectful of Takagi, but I would say they're playing a similar game, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the point I'm kind of making here is most cases, working class guy not super powerful. Maybe his one avenue in the movie is this. Yeah. He can do this. He can do it with he's... Takagi. What's up? Are you saying that's how he expresses himself, kind of? That's how he empowers himself. He knows the set of rules when it comes to man stuff, and they seem to, to a large degree, be to, to exist outside of economical status. Right? Takagi has a much larger bank account than McLean. Yeah. We just know that. Doesn't matter when they talk to each other. 1988, you're going to define what a man is. That's not super important. It helps, but it's not. It doesn't really matter, according to this movie. It's can you, can you, can you play according to other rules, I suppose. And we may, what time is it, by the way? Dear God. All right, so we don't have time today to define that, but it's part of what we're saying. Let's go over here. Might have to get a new marker. Okay. 
masculinity is not defined by money. We may or may not discover today what it is defined by. But we've already said that knowing that and using that empowers McLean, right? Because you could, you could connect what he does to the terrorists to that same idea, right? He has a conversation with Takagi. He has a conversation with the uh, chief deputy. He has a different kind of conversation with Carl and uh, Hans and all those guys. But it's all about violence. You tell a guy he got butt fucked on national television, that's a violent way to speak to somebody. Well, he does the same thing to Carl. There's the, the line when he starts chasing him and he's like, you should have heard how your brother squealed when I broke his neck. That's how your brother squealed when I broke his fucking neck, he says. I love that line. I hate that I'm recording this. I say things like that to my children sometimes. <laughs> my wife gets very upset with me. I'm like, I'm just quoting a movie. And it, anyway, I'll try to edit that out. Um, but it's all about violence. It's about engaging, enacting violence over someone else, usually another man. Can't think, I mean, they may, I, I don't think they do it to women. At least McLean doesn't. Uh, but it's about exerting your will over another man. Either literally with violence or metaphorically through speech but it's all about violence and exerting your will so one thing we're saying masculinity not defined by money uh, any man can empower himself in terms of his own masculinity by enacting his will through violence now here's the interesting part. That could probably be a paper all by itself, okay? At the very least, it gets you going. You have a lot to talk about there. What still interests me is a point we made a while ago, because I think it's true, he's at a disadvantage. He can empower himself through violence in sort of spurts, right? He'll take out a terrorist here, a terrorist there, he can never meet them head on. Sure, and that, that's, that's what the disadvantage engage in, right? But the point we started to kind of think about is, does that help him appreciate really what it is to be disadvantaged in the one way he's normally not? Because you know, again, all this stuff, these are all the ways he's disadvantaged that we know about. Please don't write me a paper where your thesis is something like, Working class people have a hard time when it comes to money. Like, fuck, okay, yeah, okay. I'm really bummed I gotta read this now. Yeah, yeah. We're saying this is the last bastion a guy like that has. But now they're gonna, in a way, take that. They're gonna challenge him there. He's not used to being challenged there. And to see, to truly be disadvantaged, uh, sort of lack power in that way, we kind of started to say helps him to appreciate this, right? And I still think somehow that can get us here. I'm gonna save us some time. I know we're gonna run out. What do I mean by any of that? A good although or a good however will force you to do more, okay? We have an argument here, it could be good enough, but if you follow with a however, you're going to demand more from yourself. Because you're saying, however, I'm going to say something even more true than that. So, however, can't exert his will as he would like. The way he speaks to the deputy captain or whoever it is, um, he can't act like that to all the terrorists or they'll blow him away, is what we're basically saying. I'm a, and I'm going to save some board space. Therefore, he's disadvantaged. Again, in the one way that he's never been before, 
Okay, he's truly powerless maybe now. And that allows him to appreciate the feminine perspective because at least in this context, historically, stereotypically, they're supremely disadvantaged. They're not really even, even in this movie, allowed to enact violence upon other people, right? What's Holly's big action in the film? She ducks. That's not violence. That's avoiding violence, right? Thoughts and questions. I mean it because I know for a hot minute there I was going off by myself. So I... Plus, this is dead. So. Uh, kind of get what you're saying there. So, to bring it all back, we have a couple minutes left. I wanted to do body paragraphs, but we didn't end up doing that, and that's fine. Thesis is important as well. What we're saying here, we are trying to not just talk about McLean, we're trying to apply this to this question, okay? So again, part of it seems to be traditionally, one would expect the working class, uh, a working class character to be disadvantaged. We know that. In Die Hard, uh, we find in every man who finds a way to overcome great odds, uh, maybe even in spite of his economic background. Well, the question is, how does he do this? He does this by engaging in the one area, the one characteristic, where he is empowered. He's a man, like capital M, hairy, smelly man, okay? See it all through the film. Even when he's by himself, by the way, he, makes, he has those one-liners, you could argue that's him, like, like when he's in the ventilation shaft all by himself. He's like, I'm still a man. I'm in a ventilation shaft. I'm still a man. Okay. But he can't do it like other capital M men in movies like this have done it before. Again, the question is why? Because he's outnumbered by corporate types, both before terrorists show up and after. So he has to go another way. He has to try something else, something he's not used to, something he's less comfortable with. He has to accept the fact that he doesn't have power. On some level, we're arguing this. The fact that working class men, for some reason, can't accept that they're powerless, they will never be able to empower themselves. I think. Does that make any sense? Probably not. I'll put it to you this way. Like, I say this as a guy that grew up poor. We talked about this with Rocky, by the way. The American dream. You, especially if you start out low on the totem pole, are taught that there's a way up, right? You just gotta get your break, or you gotta fix, something's gotta happen, but if you can do it, you can live in a mansion, you can pee on people, you can do whatever you want. Like, you, you, you made it, right? You did it. The trick in Rocky is that that's not maybe terribly realistic to think that that's even possible, right? Rocky owns it at the end, and he has a kind of a victory. And part of what we said is like maybe that's all the victory he could have, but goddamn it, he had one. Here, I think we're and again ten years, twelve years later after Rocky, we seem to be suggesting when we think about class. Something to do with the power of accepting your own disadvantages. As soon as McLean acknowledges he's not as powerful as these guys, he can't go in, guns blazing, what have you, he allows himself 
to to eventually triumph, right? And there's again, there's twists and turns through that. He doesn't do it by himself. His wife helps. Al helps. But even those, you could argue, are admissions on the part of the film that this one guy isn't enough, right? Like the story, as far as like rags to riches, isn't an individual story. And the movie kind of argues that McLean accepts that in the end. He's not going to be the most powerful guy, not even in his own marriage. He's fine with that. Basically what I'm saying is it's the American dream in 1988 in Die Hard isn't just getting what you want, being a little bit successful, but again, maybe lowering that bar a little bit, making it more, not just realistic, but uh, to where you're less of, less of an asshole in accomplishing your dreams, right? You share it with other people or something? Like, basically like working with what you got. Do I know? working with what you got well and admitting what you have again i think that's a big part of the problem with all the guys in rocky right like you even i, and I know there's a scene where there's multiple scenes where uh, mclean is like looking through bags he's he's taking inventory of what he has he's metaphorically taking inventory of what he has <laughs> who am i in this situation what can i actually do do i need to run right now do i need to hide those are not masculine things, right? But he's throwing that shit out the window, right? We're kind of arguing in a way. Maybe that gets in his way, potentially. Depending on where that goes, maybe that's part of what holds him down in the film. It helps him at times, but if he strictly adhered to it, he'd be dead. He'd be Ellis. Like, Ellis is a different guy, but he still tries to play the game too, right? You see where that gets him. I said a lot at you. So there's definitely something here about class. It could be wrapped up in masculinity. It doesn't have to be. But I think it's... Whatever you talk about in the movie, it's something to do with McLean being honest with himself about who he is versus maybe what he wants and like whether or not he has to change, like how he sees things, right? Does that make any sense? Maybe a little, okay. I know we're pretty much out of time. Does anybody have any questions for me before I let you go? All right. I meant, and I mean it, I totally meant to talk about body paragraphs today. We didn't do that. I feel like we did good work. If you could follow my like Zodiac Killer note-taking style, um, I think we did some good work. Um, what I would tell you, because we uh, you have body paragraphs due on courses, if we were to approach this uh, paper, um, which one of you is writing about this, so good luck to you following this bananas, uh, whatever this is. Um, Body paragraphs are the same way we talked about with Rocky, and we've been doing this for the past couple classes anyway. Focus on a scene, and then more specifically, focus on a specific element from that scene. So when he walks into the building and meets Takagi, we could write a body paragraph on the stuff that happens before he actually runs into Takagi, right? The music, his mode of dress, his facial expressions, him, um, even bumping into another woman because he's checking out that, that lady like against the sunset. There's tons of stuff you can dig into just there. That's a body paragraph, okay? Focus on something particular, make an argument about it. Yes, sir? Does there have to be a specific scene or can you like maybe bring similarities together for multiple scenes? In one body paragraph? Well, maybe not like, you know, making an extremely long body paragraph. But yeah. Maybe quickly pointing out multiple... If it's real fast. Yeah. Um, and we'll just see what you come up with. But I, I would say my rule of thumb would be every body paragraph you want to be as specific as you can. And if you if you bury yourself with evidence, you're not going to have room to talk about anything. Right. So that it might even, you, you might even gesture like it happens here and here and many other places as well. Like you may not have time. You know what I'm saying? Maybe like bring up one specific 
and then just make the point that it's, it happens throughout the movie. So obviously it's important. Yes, you can do that. Any other questions? All right, we will talk about body paragraphs next time, not least of which because you'll have some. And that's all I got. I'll see you guys Monday. Thank you.